Welcome to our fifth video about the network technology thread. Today we will learn something about Core App. In this video I will make the theoretical part and in the next video we will then also a practical programming example with our NIF52840 developer kits. Core App is just short for Constraint Application Protocol. It's a protocol especially designed for IoT and WSN devices. In the last video, we uh, exchange already data using the protocol UDP, but UDP uh, belongs to the transport layer and it's not really meant that we are programming with this protocol as an application layer. It has also a few limitations. For example, is UDP not reliable? We don't get any confirmation that the package what we send really uh, receives the other device. If we need such a mechanism, we would have to implement this by our own, or we could use TCP, but TCP is just optional in Thread. Um, it has a quite complex handshaking mechanism and so on, and uh, mostly it's not implemented because it's just too complex for IoT and WSN devices. Also, UDP does not structure any communication exchange. When we're sending just temperature data, it's okay. Uh, we uh, know the structure or uh, it's quite simple. But when you're having more data which we have to send or collect, it's not really convenient. One solution which we all know already for this is the protocol HTTP. Um, but HTTP is TCP based and not really suitable for IoT and WSN devices. So the so solution for this is a core app protocol. Core app is an application protocol for constrained devices. It's similar to HTTP. It follows also the RESTful API. So this means we're having also this client server structure and a stateless connection. So we don't store any uh, status from the connection in a state machine or something like this. The information are always in the package itself. It's specified in the RFC 7252 and uh, it's out since June 2014. When we look at the uh, layers from Thread and the OC reference model, we see uh, that we're having here Thread, the network layer with six LOPAN and IP, IP routing and the transport layer with UDP. And on the top, we're having the application layer uh, where core applies. Yeah, it doesn't belong directly to Thread, but it's <coughs> meant to use with it. And in Open Thread, it's directly implemented. Core app is a client server communication. So we have to think a little bit how we want to exchange the data. Yeah, let's assume node 2 here has a temperature sensor and node 1 wants to get the temperature data from the sensor. Then node 1 could send a GET request um, with the IP address from node 2, the port number and the temperature resource. And node 2 answers then with the status code and the temperature as payload. This is one solution, but the disadvantage here is that the temperature server has to be always on, of course, uh, so it could not be a battery-powered node. And mostly a, a sensor node which collecting data is battery-powered. A second disadvantage is if it's not only one sensor, if you need more data, then uh, we need a resource for every sensor, like pressure, humidity, and uh, particle matter and so on, then it's become quite complex uh, client-server structure. There is a more suitable use case where one node acts as database server. This node is then always on and our node with the sensor making a put request uh, on the IP address on the port, then on the resource store data, sending send the data, and on node 2 uh, the data will be stored or processed or whatever. And uh, optional, it can send also acknowledgement if the data is really received. 
with Thread and Coop together, we have some possibilities to build up quite nice application use cases um, and also communication with the cloud. Let's assume a use case like this one. We're having here different uh, thread mesh networks, which are placed in different buildings, which measure air quality. And every uh, thread device having then different kind of sensors, like for particle matter, carbon dioxide, temperature, humidity, and so on. And every mesh network is directly connected via one or more thread border devices to the internet and in the internet we're having our cloud server. We are IPv6, we can now directly communicate with our cloud server and uh, with core app even uh, we can quite easily store the data on the cloud server. Yeah? We're just making, for example, a put request and store the whole sensor data on the cloud server and the cloud server on the other way can react also when it's analyzed the data and seeing oh there are values which are dangerous or something it can inform some mesh network and if there's something like a traffic light it can set the status to red. In Core App we have four different message types two for a request and two for a response. A request can either confirmable or non-confirmable. When we're sending a confirmable request, we're expecting from the server acknowledgement as response. If we're asking for a wrong resource which is not available, the server answer with a reset. The frame structure from a core app frame looks like this. We're having first two bits for the co-op version, the actual version is still one. Then it's followed by two bits for the message type and four bits for the token length. The token length can also be a zero when we don't want to use the token, but the token can be quite useful to identify a request response communication. The token is chosen from the client and it should be unique and the server always answers then with the same token, so we can identify the uh, response to a request. Afterwards, there's followed one byte with a status code. I will come to this in one minute. Then followed with two bytes for a message ID. The message ID is just a unique ID, which a counter, which is always counted up when we send a core app frame it's for example to identify duplicated uh, messages. Then it's followed from 0 to 8 bytes for the token and then we're having a field for options. This can be a, uh, one option or more or even no option. We'll come to this also in a minute. Then it's followed with one byte for a delimiter. This is just everything set to one the eight bits and then followed uh, from a payload. The co-app status codes are quite similar to the HTTP status codes. We're having eight bits, three bits for a class part and five bits for a code. The class can be a, for example method, it's a class zero, success is a class one, Client error class 4 and server error class 5. So after the class, it's followed from a code. Code, for example, if we uh, send a request and uh, sending the status code 0, then it can be with a 1, can be a get request, or 2 with a post request, 3 a put request, and so on. And as response, we can get this status uh, class success with a 1 followed from one of these codes. It depends on what's happened. For example, if we send a put request, um, then it can say, yeah, the data set is created. Then we can get um, 1, 0, 1 as answer, for example. If there went something wrong, we can get also errors. So with a 4 we're getting a client error. We know it from HTTP for example quite often. 
If a resource is not found, then we're getting 4, 0, 4 as answer. If it's in server error, it starts with 5. So option field contains additional parameter for our connection. There are option numbers which identify the option. So the number 11, for example, specifies the URI path to the resource which we want to reach. So number 12 uh, specifies the content format from our payload. There is a list with the option number in the RFC. We see here, for example, the list. And there are 15 predefined option numbers. Now we want to take a look with Wireshark if we can identify this frame structure here in a, at an example. So I start Wireshark and send a co-app message. So here we have one. I just open it and we're seeing here so co-app header and I can open it and we're seeing here we're having first the version numbers and the message type. In this case it's a confirmable message. Token length is zero, so I didn't specify it any token. Then we're having the status code, it's a put request, then followed with a message ID. And here we're having the two additional options. The first one it's just the URI pass. <coughs> Here it's store data. And the second one is a payload format, which is in this type JSON. And when I look in the payload, I can also see that the payload here, we're having the temperature and it's in JSON format. Yeah. This was the theoretical part about the constraint application protocol. We learned that it's quite similar to HTTP. It follows also the RESTful API concept and we're having the client server structure. There are additional features which is um, resource discovery for example which is quite useful but we are not going here into details especially open thread doesn't implement this feature at the moment. In the next video we will see then a practical example. We are using an open thread and the Nordic um, NRF 52840 developer kits for an example. And I hope I see you in the next video.